You're listening to Art, I Swear, and I'm your host, Vanessa Van Alstein. This week's podcast was suggested inadvertently by my friend Elle Klaus, who I've recommended before for her book, Stealing the Wolf Prince. Elle wanted me to cover some very romantic French painters for this topic, and being a romance writer, it makes sense why she would like romantic French painting. I'm hesitant to cover topics like this because I'd like my focus to mostly be modern and contemporary art because I feel like that's a area people need improvement on. She got a little frustrated with me and goes, fine, cover Dada. And I'm like, that's a great idea. And she's like, you know, Dada's, I think the art's really ugly. And I'm like, I think you're kind of getting the point. Good job. Good job there. So Elle, this one's for you, girl. Now, if you want the quick and dirty on Dada, I would say to you that this is the moment the art world opened a window during World War I, looked outside, saw mechanical warfare, closed it, and just kind of went a little crazy. What, what else? How else do you respond to that kind of atrocity? Instead of seeking order like Mondrian did during World War I, these guys kind of throw it away. They try to release the restraints of bourgeois society, that is middle class society, and force it to reconsider itself as something bohemian and unique and undefinable so that rigid structure that had caused Europe to fall into this level of chaos and warfare would never be able to repeat again. So Dada happens during a very narrow period from about the start of World War I to, I'd say it's definitely over by 1930. Really, it's taken over mostly by surrealism by about 1923-1924. This is also one of the art movements that I'm going to talk about that is not solely visual art like painting and sculpture. It extends into music. There's experimental pieces. I'll actually play one for you right now.
this work influences later abstract musicians like John Cage and Philip Glass, who you might be a little bit more aware of. It also involves a lot of experimental cinema, which later translates over into surrealism. They're very influenced by Eisenstein's theory of montage. He was a Soviet propagandist who experimented in early cinema and discovered a lot of the principles that we still use in modern movie making. And if you've now got that South Park song, we're going to do a montage stuck in your head. Well, you know, (laughs) Merry Christmas. Dada also moves into the realm of poetry. Two of the biggest members of the Dada movement are men named Hugo Ball and Tristan Zara. These two poets kind of lead the movement. Ball is more influential in the early years. He lives in Zurich, Switzerland, which is neutral during World War I. A lot of artists flee to Switzerland and the United States and and the Netherlands and a couple of other neutral places because they, number one, don't want to get drafted, and number two, don't agree with the war. In Zurich, Switzerland, they form a group of ragtag dancers and musicians and poets and painters and sculptors and etc that all gather together in a place called the Cabaret Voltaire. Now you probably heard that parodied in a couple of things because well this is a moment where a lot of intellectuals come together and form the basis of what is going to become modern creative society. The modernists take a firm root here and a lot of them do come from schools of impressionism, the Favis, the this and that is. There's a lot of isms at this point. And all isms kind of form under a manifesto and begin their own movement to change how we see things. However, this one, like I said, it has roots in surrealism. It later begins to affect uh, like more minimalist works, especially when you look at the ARPs. A lot of the men and women, and I'm really going to stress women here because women were hugely involved in this movement, whereas they're not in a lot of other ones. A lot of them go on to teach at the Bauhaus. And if you've listened to my other podcasts, you'll know that the Bauhaus is a school of art that is hugely influential on how the Western world makes and views artwork into the current century or millennia or whatever you want to say. One of the women that were involved in the Cabaret Voltaire is a woman named Sophie Tober Arp. She's married to an artist who's becomes very famous himself and a little more so than her early on because, because you know, what genitals you have affect how well you did in the world back then. And his name is either shown as Jean Arp or Hans Arp. He came from the border of what was Lorraine, and like Germany back then. And this area is now, I think where he's from is in Germany. You might've heard this referred to as Alsace Lorraine. It's that group of mountains that Germany and France get into a little pissy match over early in World War I and in World War II that kind of sets off both world wars. The Arps got together and got married and were really this like extraordinary creative couple. She at this point in Zurich, is a teacher, and she's working in the womanly arts of textiles. And this is something you find a lot of female artists are involved in. At this point in time in particular, I'm going to say up in, well, they kind of reclaimed it in the 70s and 80s, but that's a whole other podcast. It's appropriate to weave. There's even a Greek goddess of weaving that sets this up like thousands of years ago. So you see in the ball house and a lot of early modernist schools, the women are primarily part of the fiber arts divisions. And it, it, uh, because you know, it's ladylike to sit there and embroider, whatever. And her works are extremely influential on what I would say is 1950s America. If you go back and look at a lot of her patterns, you can see how they were like recontextualized and reused in what becomes the thriving American landscape. And I actually like a lot of her painting work a lot better than her husband's. Um, he does. He is the one that kind of pushes her into painting and sculpture a little bit because they form this dialogue and start working together. But when he met her, she was putting her career at risk, dancing and making puppets for the Cabaret Voltaire. So you have to imagine this woman that's a fairly well-esteemed 
academic for the time. She's a school teacher, which is a noteworthy profession for a woman. And she's a textile art teacher, which is a reasonable art for a woman. She's playing it safe and she's doing what she needs to do to get by so that she's sneaking off at night and being part of this wild bohemian culture. Dada is the period of art that you think about with the eccentric artist laying on top of tapestries talking about, you know, their wild poems and not being so sexually repressed and not being so adherent to like gender norms and roles in society that are prescribed. So Sophie's school tells her, you have to stop going to the Cabaret Voltaire or we will fire you. This is not appropriate. You're going to give us a bad name. To get away with going to the Cabaret Voltaire, she simply makes a whole bunch of masks. And some of these are still in existence and they're very valuable. And her and her husband during this period like to experiment with what they call random art. You see, Dada, and you're probably going, what does the word Dada mean? Well, let's backtrack a little bit. Supposedly, when Ball named it, they flipped open a dictionary, stuck their finger down, and chose a meaning. And this was the French word for hobby horse, Dada. The Slavic countries like Czechoslovakia, like uh, the Balkans, would tell you that they simply adapted it because it means yes, yes in their language. And the English Dadists would say, well, it means Dada, the patriarchal figure that's at the core of what we're fighting against. So what is Dada? What does Dada mean? Well, yes, you've already figured it out. You've got it. Okay, good. No, actually, I don't think you understand. Get it? Got it? Good? All right. No, maybe not. And it's from this point of confusion that you begin to break down what they see as the bourgeois society. There's also an influence of Karl Marx here. He believed that an artist didn't need to be this trained person set up by society who exists under the influence of patrons, that an artist is somebody that naturally comes to create, and that in part of a communist society, so yes, these guys were communists. If you're gonna look for a theme in early 20th century art, I would say to you, communism. So they were also trying to kind of understand this and hoping that by being the artist that Marx wanted them to be, they're going to break down middle-class society and start to create the utopia that communism eventually promises. So the ARPs and their random art, they're working in basic geometrics a lot like what Mondrian does. However, Like I said, they're not as interested in that rigid geometrical purity that he sees as almost the spiritual thing. They want to let that go. They want to be free spirits, man. They're like early hippies. So let's throw this piece of paper and make a piece of artwork based on where it lays. And they do that for quite some time. And a lot of this artwork is difficult for viewers because they see it as uh, overly simplistic or as ugly or is having uncomfortable like biological references. And Arp, the male Jean or Hans or whatever you want to call him, is later the person that biomorphic is first applied to. His much, much later sculptures towards the end of his life are called biomorphic. But you can see early on these uh, hints at anatomy, which anything that makes a viewer in the 2010s uncomfortable, really, really made a viewer in the 1910s uncomfortable. And yes, a lot of what we're talking about is either already 100 years old or turning 100 years old at the time of this podcast. So I want you to think about this kind of modernity and how we still consider it the edge of what's avant-garde today. And it's been well over a hundred years. And avant-garde is a very good word to use when it refers to these people. In fact, this is where art starts applying this term to people. And what avant-garde really means when it comes to people like the Dadists is that they're existing in a realm that is beyond what the art world is ready to understand at this point. They're cutting edge, so to speak. And there is this playful, humorous, absurdist quality to this work. And I would, especially with the noise poems that are being created by Hugo Ball, suggest that you look at absurdist humor when you're looking at these works. Because by embracing the absurd, they're once again able to isolate themselves from the society that they feel like is breaking apart. A sense of humor, a playful manner, 
is a way to communicate with people something that is both uncomfortable but also worth considering. One artist I would have you look at during this period that has a very weird sense of humor is Marcel Duchamp, and he probably needs his own podcast. He is somebody that really embraces Dada. He's a, he's a French fellow, and pretty much every piece of artwork that Duchamp ever created, the title is a pun or a play on words or some kind of joke. Now, if you're going, is that the guy that hung a urinal upside down and signed it R. Mutt? Yes, it is. If you're outraged by what's called a ready-made, when you take a previous existing item and recontextualize it by putting it on the gallery wall, if you're going, who wants to look at a urinal? Exactly. Isn't it hilarious that you're, you're coming in there and you're looking at a urinal? Doesn't it make you reconsider the quality and the visuals of the ordinary things that are now in part of your industrialized life that has brought on this horrible, terrible war. Another piece that a lot of people forget about that Duchamp made during the Dada period is the Mona Lisa with a mustache. Now, how is painting a mustache on a reproduction of the Mona Lisa really anything other than a bad joke. Well, think of him as an early, you know, like graffiti or street or urban artist. Think him as think of him as somebody that is trying to rip down these existing notions of what is art and what is not art. And it's interesting because Duchamp did actually challenge gender norms by spending a couple of years as a woman named Rose Selavy and that's a it's a dirty pun. So he's not somebody that's afraid of what society thinks of him so much, but he he is definitely always softening things with a little bit of an absurd joke. Another artist I'm gonna mention who later has a huge effect on how the world sees art is Max Ernst. He's one of the artists that comes out of Dada and goes straight into the Bauhaus and begins to influence the way art's made in the 20th century. So what eventually happens to Dada? Why does this begin to fall apart? Why does this turn into surrealism? The founding member of Dada, uh, Hugo Ball, I like to think of him as a sweet poet sort, that he has this point in history where things have fallen apart so much. He can go after this beautiful collective of minds. And he does this wholeheartedly, throwing himself into it. But the political turmoil that's involved in keeping this many creatives together begins to kind of tear at him. So the Cabaret Voltaire, he's performing pretty much every night. He's having people that normally wouldn't make poetry make poetry. He's involved in these dances and paintings and all of this wonderful stuff. But in 1920, he has this return to Catholicism. And... He begins to have this very quiet, poor life. He's still writing. He's still contributing to stuff. However, about seven years later, he actually dies of stomach cancer. So how do you go from tearing down the bourgeois and living amongst these fabulous artistic types that are way ahead of their time to a poor Roman Catholic? He's not a monk, but he almost lives like a monk who dies tragically young. Well, part of him that could bring people together like this was so optimistic and in a way kind of pure that he eventually just couldn't handle the chaos of it because to reflect something like World War I artistically, you really are talking about embracing the chaotic worst. The person who kind of stands up and very pointedly tries to lead Dada, even during Ball's reign, is Tristan Zara. And his original name is Samuel Rosenstock. He chooses to um, take on a different name for the his poetry. He was of Romanian and French ancestry. Now, Zara, unlike Ball, is actually Jewish, so... He has a little bit of a different experience living going into um, going into the arts early on. He is a very well-regarded reg- Romanian writer. However, Romania 
at that time and maybe even still was not very friendly towards Jewish people. So I like to think that becoming part of this group and helping found the Dada movement in Zurich, that Zara, the the level of equality that's afforded by a bunch of people deviating from what's considered normal behavior gave him a launching pad with which to feel more equal. He is a very political man, very anti-fascist, very pro-communist, and is always looking to promote this futuristic ideal of what society can be. Unfortunately, because of the clownish, uh, loosey-goosey nature of Dada, it's hard to hold it together as just one movement over a long period of time when what you are creating as anti-establishment is tearing down the bourgeois. When you begin to structure things, you begin to have a problem. And Zara, while very much interested in promoting the concepts of Dada, because to him, this he also kind of, in some ways, hastens the decay, because in trying to regain control, he bumps heads with one of the artists that's named Picaba and another one uh, named Britton, who was originally a Breton, that was originally a uh, Cubist. And he even eventually butts heads with Duchamp and several others who move off to New York to start their, quote, own school of Dada. And he's very begrudging and that they can go ahead and continue to practice this without him. So in May 1922, he actually helps Dada stage his own funeral. And this happens in the Weimar Republic, which is later, which is Germany now. It occurs at a festival that was at the Ballhouse Art School. Notice we brought that up again. And part of Zara's um, part of Zara's eulogy is the statement, Dada is useless like everything else in life. Dada is a virgin microbe which penetrates with the insistence of all air into all those spaces that reason has failed to feel with words and convictions. And it's at this point in 1922 where he, with several other people who had been involved in Dada and some that were kind of still very new to it, like Salvador Dali, begins to explore surrealism. So this is kind of a quick summary on Dada. If you've seen Hitchhiker's Guide from the Galaxy, that scene where uh, the main character looks out the window and sees the bulldozer and doesn't quite comprehend the bulldozer until it's about to bulldoze his house, I kind of think that this is the art period equivalent of that. The good news is that it uh, influenced a lot of what's considered modern art and later translates into uh, contemporary art that's going on right now. On the bad side, well, kind of creates a lot of the cliches that begin to isolate people from artwork. So hopefully you'll appreciate this period a little bit more. You kind of see how it's uh, translating in surrealism. Now, who would you like to hear me cover? Is there a period? Is there a person? Do you want to know a little bit more about Marcel Duchamp? Well, leave me a little comment down in the comment section. Uh, you can also email us at artiswear at gmail.com. And, you know, always like and share the video. If you like and share, well, you know, good things will happen to you. This is Vanessa Van Alstein. This is Art I Swear, and you have a creative day. Intro and outro provided by Joe Giggs. If you want to do, do, do the da, da, da in New York City with a great DJ, please check out Joe Giggs. Samples taken for, with permission by Iridiles Conan Project.